So we'll look at the 1980 to 1982 recession compared to the Great Depression. So the 1980 to 1982, everybody agrees, it's just like the Great Depression. The Federal Reserve fucked up because it raised the interest rates. It lowered the amount of money. It contracted the money supply instead of expanding it. And so, therefore, there was less money, less credit, everybody's scared, everybody's squeezing and holding on to the little bit of money that they got, and they made it worse. And so, generally, during a depression, during a recession, during a crisis, it's good to lower interest rates and get money flowing. Just get it flowing. Just start printing money up, start passing it around everywhere. That seems to be the common, you know wisdom of the 2020 era, but in 1980, you had high oil prices, high inflation, you had no more commitment to the 100% full unemployment, which America used to be committed to, not accepting 5% unemployment, that's okay, no, it's not okay, 4% want jobs, they should get jobs, we used to have 100% full employment. And that was good for workers' wages and benefits, and since we don't have it, that's bad for workers' wages and benefits and conditions. And Re Reaganomics. You cannot ignore Ronald Reagan in this situation. Whether you agree or disagree, I think he did well or didn't do well. But Reaganomics, his tax cuts, his $80 billion deficits, his bank deregulation, his firing of the air traffic controllers, letting age run rampant, uh, that's, you know, all this contributes to the confidence of a nation, and Ronald Reagan was just an undeniable figure, and he pushed his economic program onto America, so you have to acknowledge Reaganomics played a part in the recession, and Reaganomics was kind of consistent with Jimmy Carteronomics, uh, Jimmy Carter had high uh, interest rates, federal fund, 21.5% federal funds rate. So to call this the Volcker Recession, the 1980 to 1982 Volcker Recession is, that's absolutely 100% accurate. It spans two presidents, and there's, you know, high oil prices, high inflation for both of those 10 years. Also, no more commitment to 100% full unemployment. And so, mainly, the main reason Paul Volcker raised the federal funds rate up to 21.5% for the, you know, entire two to three years of the 1980 to 1982 recession. So, that's the, you know, that was a recession that happened way, way back in the day. Now, the 1837 Depression, I think, is actually, uh, you should study it and learn it and understand it because that's when America... We got off of a bank. <laughs> we said we're not going to have a bank. And so actually all these panics would be interesting because up until 1913, we're not going to have a central bank of America known as the free banking era. So the causes of the panic of 1837, it was a land and cotton bubble burst. Overproduction of cotton and prices of cotton dropped. So that just taught us that one commodity if the entire, you know, economy is based upon one commodity and it goes belly up, then everybody goes belly up. So oil going down can sink the dollar. It totally can. Because cotton backed the dollar back then the way, you know, the bank note, whatever fucking bank note they were using. In 18, whatever state bank note, you know, speculative bullshit fiat bank note they were using back then. So land and cotton bubble burst in the market. That's what fucked up America in 1837. So, with the Volcker recession, you had the Fed, and you had, you know, the bank, the Central Bank of America, who is doing interest rates. The whole point of the federal funds rate is they charge money for when banks transfer money to other banks, the Fed gets a percentage of that. I believe that's what there's like three tools of the Fed, and it's more complicated than that, but I think that's essentially the, the point of the federal funds rate. So they, don't, they can't say that the Fed is, you know, the rate is this, but they can do other shit to get the Fed fund raise, you know, Fed fund to rise. But anyways, um, I don't know if the causes of the Panic of 1837 would be useful for this because they had oil prices increased. And so oil prices increased, 
the demand is still there, but now the supply is going to be less. People have to, you know, spend more money. And you're going to, the 1973, you had the gas lines. So all those politics, that oil politics, OPEC, OPEC doubled their prices. Where before in 74, you know, they just raised it substantially. So 79, they made it worse. So maybe to intentionally sink America. So how come high oil prices and very low oil prices can sink America? That's kind of nuts. Isn't that crazy? What, oil prices aren't perfectly in the middle? They're not perfectly consistent? Oh, my fucking God. Start pull your money out of the bank. Start getting the toilet paper, you know. Store, store up all the toilet paper you can right now. And in fact, you'll be, you know, rich when it comes to the Great Depression. You're the man with all the fucking toilet paper. Sell it for, you know, fucking twenty dollars. Goddamn roll. <laughs> so the Great Depression. Most people understand the Great Depression. I also had some notes about the Great Depression. Ben Bernanke. So the Great Depression had the federal government, the Federal Reserve, the central bank raise the federal interest rates too. So we're going to see federal interest rates go up with the 1980 recession, and we're going to see federal interest rates go up with the 1929 Great Depression. In 1837, there is no central bank. Andrew Jackson killed the bank. Andrew Jackson is also the only person who has ever, in the entirety of U.S. history, paid the debt of America. So what's the likelihood that America is going to pay off her debt Zero. He, she, she only did it one time in, you know, January 19, 1835. In the early 1800s, that was the last time America paid her debt, you know, completely off. So, yeah, automation, I mean, there's a lot of similarities, too, and uh, differences. So let's take a look at the causes of the 1929 Great Depression. Herbert Hoover, he's like, you know, Schubert Humphrey, inept, competent douchebag. No deposit insurance. So we got the FDIC in 1980. We got the Security and Exchange Commission in 1980. There was an unaddressed August and September 1929 recession. They're doing shit about the recession. They're doing shit about the inflation. They're not really doing shit about the recession. And, you know, this is easily could turn into a depression. You got to pay attention to those two big to fail companies when they collapse. Make sure they don't send a ripple effect and have, all, you know, you don't, it's okay for, you know, a hundred banks to fail, but it's not okay for a thousand banks to fail. Automation, the increase of mechanization of the workplaces, that's true still today. Disruption of production. I'm not sure why production was being disrupted, but production should never be disrupted for any reason whatsoever. So you have the coronavirus. The coronavirus is disrupting production. So that's a similarity to the Great Depression. The Dolls Act, we had given a loan to Germany. They failed, so then they couldn't pay off their bills, which hurt us. So I don't know if we have outstanding loans to, you know, Germany or other countries that are going belly up. There was also segregation in 1929. You're not going to get integrated America until, you know, 19, what, 54 Board of... Um, you know, Board of Education decision, but then the integration will be Civil Rights Act, 1963. So that's when, you know, integration becomes the law of the land. So up until the 1963, this is obvious to me. I mean, with segregation comes racism, with, uh, you know, segregation comes hatred. And all these things are negative, you know, if you're all about the energies, these are really bad negative energies you're throwing out into the atmosphere. <clears throat> but specifically, it doesn't help trade. So if you want to go back to basic Adam Smith, you know, what's good for the economy, it's good when two people meet up and they're independent individuals and they make an agreement that they both agree on and like and they both win, right? They sell the good that you're looking for. You get the good. They get the money. Both parties agree to the deal and both parties are better off for it. So you have to have an in, two independent people. So with segregation, that second-class citizen, can they actually, you know, prisoners and slaves cannot make a contract because they have no rights. They're being cursed. They're being forced. They have no They can't. So segregation is a barrier to trade. Segregation did not help trade. It's saying, you know what, we're, we can't do banking. We can't do housing. We can't do, you know, any uh, education. We can't do transportation. We can't do jack shit. 
with the half, you know, the other half of the people on the other side of the railroad tracks just right over the hill. Just right over there. No, we can't sell. We can't buy. No economic whatsoever. That's a huge barrier to trade. So, the, you know, that's way worse than, you know, there was like some racism and shit in the Ronald Reagan, but I don't think you'd say it was like segregation, you know, in an institutional segregation racism. <laughs> institutional segregation. Uh, I don't know, maybe. Anyway, so the overproduction of toasters, washing machines, refrigerators, cars, and furniture. I don't ever see how surplus could ever be a bad thing. Yeah, I, I don't. I, some things are just sort of common sense. Surplus is not a bad thing, especially if it's got, you know, if it's a durable good. So if you make a bunch of washing machines and they're going to be useful for, you know, decades, that means people aren't going to buy brand new washing machines. So that the lesson of 1929, the Great Depression, is to make a bunch of shitty goods so that way you can keep on producing, you know, washing machines every year and that it keeps you in business. No. Keep making kick-ass, you know, durable goods. And when you have a surplus, sit on it and give it to charity or give it to, you know, third world markets. You don't have to sit there and just say, oh, fuck it, we we're just going to have to take a huge loss. Yeah, you didn't get all that fucking, you know, quick sh money win as soon as the shit was produced. But to assume you can't make, you can always make money. You can make money off of, if you pick a bushel of beans, you can make three bucks off that bushel of beans. So you can't sell today, you can't sell tomorrow. Maybe you can refrigerate it and sell it, you know, in a couple days. Washing machines, toasters, refrigerators, cars, furniture, these things, you know, have longevity. They last. They have an intrinsic value. So in 10 years, they'll still be, you know, value, just the same value if they're brand new and not used in 10 years. Keep them in storage. Keep them in surplus. You can have an oil surplus. That's great for gas is, you know, about prices when in the 90s. Gas is almost down to the 1990s prices. There was a stock market dip. Most people put all the emphasis on the Great Depression on the October stock market dip in 1929. If you look at the stock market right now, it's actually doing the exact same thing. We've lost one-third of the value. It dipped 9000 and that lost one-third of the value. So the stock market crash wasn't a crash. It just dipped. It was like 300 points, and then it went to 250. It wasn't a crash. It was like, oh, shit, this, you know, really dropped. This is a stock market, you know, drop. So the press, the sensational press, they exacerbated crash. It's worst thing ever. Oh, shit, what's now? The dollar is dead. Monetary contraction policy of the feds. So you got a stock market that's the same for today in, um, there was a 1987 stock market crash, and that didn't sink the economy. So there was, the stock market was doing fine in the early 80s, right, 1980, 1981, 1982. I don't hear nothing about, oh, shit, the poor stock market. But the monetary contraction policy of the feds raised the federal funds rate during the recession. So not only was the recession not addressed in August and September 1929, but the Central Bank of America is going to raise interest rates. And throughout the Great Depression, so they're going to exacerbate it. Poverty in the working masses cannot compete with investment banks. Milton Freeman says that the Great Depression, the whole problem with the Great Depression, isn't the whole stock market thing. That was a problem, but it was all the banks that were failing. So banks are just failing left and right, here and there. I mean, that's, that can't be good for the economy, just having, you know, massive bank failure everywhere. So massive bank failure everywhere. Well, that was happening in the 1980, you know, Great Recession. You had savings and loan, a thousand savings and loan banks that failed. You know, hundreds, 500 or so banks every year, this year, that year. So you had a lot of banks that failed in the Great, you know, eight 1980 recession. And that's uh, let's see, the Fed failed to regulate the state banking practices, overuse of credit. Happened because of the money multiplier effect. Yeah, all that's happening. The fractional reserve system of the Fed. Artificial roaring 20s boom. I don't remember the 1970s being artificially roaring, the roaring 70s. So you don't have that, you know, everybody's on credit, everybody's splurging, now the bubble busted. All right, the roaring 20s saw an overuse of installment loans and a low discount rate by the Fed. I'm not for sure what the discount rate was. 
in 1980. Monopolistic price in the gold standard hurt the U.S. dollar. There is no gold standard today, so 1980 didn't have to compete with the gold standard. Woodrow Wilson, he, you know, started that corrupt Federal Reserve system, so that, you know, hurt the 1929. America in 2020, America still, the entire monetary system is a house of cards. It's a paper Ponzi pyramid scheme, a house bit, built upon a fiat debt note, a fiat banker debt note. We don't actually have a People's Central Bank of America. We got the fucking Federal Reserve. And we pretend that the Federal Reserve is our central bank. And then we pretend that the Federal Reserve note is our cash money. It's our dollar. It's a Federal Reserve note. It's a dollar. Well, which is it? Is it your dollar or is it a Federal Reserve note? Can it be both? Uh, we'll pretend for now, but that doesn't seem right. It seems like we should just have money that's just cash. And then bank notes should always be, this is a bank note. This is not cash. You know, written right on it, right on the face. Terrible education system, so we still have that, right? So common man didn't understand the U.S. financial system. Still hurts Americans today. But 1930, most Americans were in school. So that doesn't help. It didn't help before. It didn't help afterwards. Today, now that they're in school, you know, you got reading and writing arithmetic. But you also got obedience to authority. Most Americans can't think for themselves. They can't think independently. They have to have someone tell them what to do. And then when no one's telling them what to do, then it's just, you know, fucking la-la land. And uh, that's it. Those are all the reasons for the Great Depression, comparing and contrast. And, you know, there is some major differences. With the 1830, you know, 7, not only do we not have a central bank or a Federal Reserve, but in 1837 we didn't even have a U.S. dollar. So I think that the causes of the 1837 uh, Depression, it was seven years. It lasted for seven years. I think it's actually worthy of comparison. So I'll, co I'll use that to compare the next, you know, modern day, 73 or maybe the dot-com bubble, 2001 or TARP. 2008 is what was most comparable for 20 and 20. So we could see the continuity between 2008 and 2020. So that maybe I could compare 2008 to 1837. Now, a word on the Great Depression. So, the Great Depression had some other shit going on, okay? Joe Kennedy is going to make their fortune. We're not going to have JFK or Robert Kennedy. We're not going to have the Kennedy boys or the Kennedy family without the Great Depression. So, in late summer 1929, Joe Kennedy is getting his shoe shined by a shoe shine boy. The shoe shine boy goes, hey, Joe, I got some Wall Street stock advice for you. And Joe Kennedy is like, all right, you know. He listened to it, but he walked away thinking, okay, if the shoeshine boy is giving me Wall Street stock advice, it's time to get out. Why does he know so much? He thinks he can make money off this? No, he's been sold a bill of goods. Joe sold all of his stock out and got out of the stock market, got out of Wall Street, and he thrived and kicked ass during the Great Depression. Ben Bernanke, in a speech honoring Milton Freeman in 2002, when Ben Bernanke was a member of the Fed, he wasn't a chair yet, but he said, regarding the Great Depression, we did it. We, the Federal Reserve, the Central Bank of America, we did it. And we're sorry, 1930 to 1933, the money supply contracted by 30%. So just like in 1980, the Fed raised interest rates in 1928 and 1929 in an attempt to limit speculation in the securities market. The gold standard connected interest rates and monetary policies to the rest of the world. So the Federal Reserve didn't act as a lender of last resort for thousands of banks failing. Thousands of banks were failing and the Fed wasn't, you know, intervening. The Fed wasn't saving thousands. I think, you know, hundreds of banks are fine. Thousands of banks are no good. Thousands of banks are failing. That's way too fucking many. So the question is, save the banks uh, what about the people, the banks that are, there's only, you know, there's 9,000 banks total in America. 38% of those 9,000 banks, so less than 4,000 banks, are actually part of the Federal Reserve System. So do we save all the banks, even the banks not a part of the Fed? What about foreign banks? Do we save foreign banks before the New York Stock Exchange took the sharp dip? Black Thursday, 1929, so-called Great Depression, right, stock, stock market crash. The London Stock Exchange had crashed one month prior. Should the Fed have saved the London Stock Exchange? The Bank of England tightening its credit 
is responsible for many U.S. recessions, I think including 1837 and depressions throughout history. So do we save all and any banks, whether they're, you know, foreign or domestic, rich or poor, honest or corrupt? No matter what, there's three types of kinds of monetary people, monetary philosophy. You got Baggett Hot's dictum. So it says that central banks should loan funds to solvent financial institutions beset by runs. So the banks that are, you know, fucking up and they don't have the money and they don't have their books right now, everybody wants their money and now they have a bank run. So Bagahot's dictum says give umbrellas to everybody, you know, all those banks who are in the rain. If a bank is in the rain and they're, you know, there's a run and they're about to fail, you give them, you save them. You save all the banks. That's a bag of knots dictum. Give umbrellas to all those banks that are stuck in the rain. The real bills doctrine says you fund more during the economic expansions and you fund less during the economic contraction. So when banks are kicking ass and doing great, you give them an umbrella. When the sun is shining, here's an umbrella. But as soon as it starts to rain, you take that umbrella away. So Real Bill's doctrine says in times of economic prosperity, of course we'll help you. The banks are going to be your best friend. But during economic contraction, oh, shit, you know, we actually need that umbrella back. You're, oh, you don't have no money? Oh, God, can we have, we need them shoes, too. We need that shirt and them shoes. Yeah, definitely the umbrella, but just a liquidationist doctrine. This is let the banks fail. Andrew Mellon of Herbert Hoover's Federal Reserve was a liquidationist. And he said, let him fail, right? If you're in the rain without an umbrella, well, what the fuck are you doing out in the rain without an umbrella? That's your own goddamn fault, and you deserve to live with the natural consequences of your own actions. So those are the three different doctrines, the three ways you could look at monetary policy when it comes to the different banks. S save any and all the banks. So if they're sick, give them medicine. Let the fucking banks fail. Who gives a goddamn shit? And then, you know, fund the banks when they're doing great. And then, you know, uh, don't fund them when they aren't doing great. When things are good, you know, join the bandwagon. But as soon as it takes a downturn, fucking bolt. Get the hell out of there. That's Bangahot's dictum, real bills doctrine, and the liquidationist doctrine. And so I guess I would be, um, I would be all three of them. I would put them all together. Because if you put them all together, what happens? The banks that fucking fail, fuck you. You did shitty with your banking. I'm not going to save a private investment company who bought a bunch of land and buildings and somehow couldn't turn a fucking profit. How'd you fuck that up? You had everybody's money. You had all the advantages in the world. Talk about sovereignty. Talk about privilege. If you're a fucking bank, you, you, there's no way you fucked up and you failed in 2000. You got a big old bailout. They've been making record profits, and as soon as what? Coronavirus? Now they need a f another fucking bailout? What'd they do with all them profits? So, yeah, I say fuck the banks. Fuck corrupt, zombie, shitty-ass companies and corporations. Now, you don't want massive all across the world, all across the country, just, you know, thousands of banks failing. So, if it turns in from hundreds to thousands, we need to start brand new banks up. We need people's banks. We need get working class and workers co-op and those kinds Get regular, ordinary people to start their own banks. And then, you know, let the banks fail. Start brand new banks that's, you know, got the American people actually involved in them. Quit giving it to the real, you know, millionaires and billionaires and shit. And just give it to average Americans. Just pick them out of a hat. Just, you know, drop off somewhere. Just pick a town in Colorado somewhere and say, okay, everybody in this town, you are now the owners of this bank. Good luck. That would be perfect. That would be a great fucking idea, frankly. So the real Bill's doctrine says fun more during... So I think good times, everybody's all happy with the good times. You want a loan? Here's a loan. Shit, you're doing good. I'm doing good. Here's another loan. You want three? Here's four. Here's 15 loans. But then when things, you know, get a little bit scarier, a little contraction, okay, shit. No, nah, I'm not going to give you any loans at all. No, no, no. So it almost seems it's kind of common sense. When things are great, it's a big-ass party, but as soon as, you know, nobody loves you when you're down and out, right? So, yeah, that's, uh, you would expect the banks to act that way. Central banks should loan funds to solid financial institutions to set by So, bang hot's dictum is what Andrew Hamilton did in the, 18, in the 1792 panic, 
and it's what you know Ben Bernanke did in 2008 with TARP, and what they're doing with the 2020 trillion dollar you know giveaway uh, Wall Street bailout uh, this year. They're doing all the same shit. Give the money to the you know companies that are about to drown. Give umbrellas to those banks in the rain. Bail them out, even though they would never give us an umbrella for in the rain. But make sure all them goddamn banks are saved. So that seems to be, you know, that's a conservative, I think, position because sometimes these big-ass banks, you know, they take, like, 20 other banks with them. But maybe that's the point. Maybe they need to, I mean, if one bank can sink 20 other banks, why the hell were you so dependent on all those other, why didn't you have your shit together? 20 banks didn't have their shit together. 20 other banks are just siphoning off of, they're just being a parent, our banks are parasites anyway. They're just being parasites to the big parasites. So... Milton Friedman, the Great Depression, huh? So, yeah, he says the collapse of the banking system during the three waves of panics from 1930 to 1933. It wasn't because of greedy corporations or protectionism or the natural boom or bust of economic cycle or the 1929 stock market crash itself. It was because of the collapse of the banking system. That's the point of the Great Depression. So that's the main problem that needs to be solved. The Fed warned of excessive speculation earlier, and it started a stock market slide, a mini crash. The warning itself hurt the market temporarily. Wall Street overreacts all the time. Wall Street is the prima donna dra drama queens. Unaddressed October or uh, August, September 1929 recession, volatile market, needed resuscitation, needed government intervention, wasn't getting any. September 4th, 1929, stocks begin to drop. Three warnings. Economy was contracting, steel production declined, construction sluggish, auto sales are going down, a lot of debt. New York Stock Exchange, September 3rd, 1929, 381 points. I don't know if it's dollars or euros or pounds or what the fuck, but 381 is what the New York Stock Exchange was, September 3rd, 1929. September 20th, 1929, the London Stock Exchange is going to crash. One month prior, so you got a recession, you got a mini recession, you got other stock markets crash, you got all these, you know, ominous warnings. The Ides of March is upon you. So 300, right? You got 381 September 3rd. This is how many points they had. So October 27, they're going to have 260 points. They lost 40 points. It was 300 or so, 380, but they lost, you know, whatever. 381 in September, but by October 27, it was at 260. October 28, it was at 230. So, oh shit, it was 381. Now it's at 230. October 29, it's a crash. It's going to dip the lowest in this period, November 13th, 198. So, 381, 198, it lost about one half of its value. The New York Stock Exchange, not the NASDAQ. Bought stocks with easy credit. Stock market's doing the same thing as Black Thursday, Monday, Tuesday, 1929. Now, we lost one-third of the value. It dropped 9,000 points. 9,000 points, that's a third of the value, it lost half the value, so it's on its way. Should we only be afraid? No, I, I don't, when the stock market gets below where Donald Trump began, that's when I'll get nervous. But not a moment too soon. Peace.